All right. Well, I did have some notes that were handed to me before the event, but uh, they've been misplaced. <laughs> but um, basically, the Organic Seed Alliance has been working to study what's going on with the state of organic seeds. And they first did an initial report in 2009, and um, they decided they're going to do it every six years after that. And um, you know, back in 2009, the, the organic seed industry was really new, and um, organic standards were you need to plant with organic seed, but there wasn't enough seed of high enough quality to meet the farmer's demands. <clears throat> so they, they've really been working to, to build that, and the good news is they've really increased the funding in organic seed breeding now. So it's, it's gone from about $9 billion to over $22 billion being spent on you know, just making good organic seed and new breeds and new varieties. But the interesting thing was, what's going on out there, then talking to organic farmers around the country, 85% of the farmers are still using conventional seed. And they're really wondering, why is that? Um, and the biggest reasons were there wasn't enough availability of those crops, and that um, it wasn't the quality anymore. The quality was there. The quality has finally come up. But mostly about availability and concern with uh, genetic crossover, that they're getting good, pure seed. And, um, Additionally, they, they kind of felt, you know, that some of the bigger farmers weren't able to get the quality and the quantities they needed. And the small farmers are, are, are sticking true. They're about 75% of the seed they're using is organic. But when we get to the bigger farms, less than 15% uh, of the, the seed they're using is organic. And um, we see this as a big opportunity for organic seed. And when they're looking at what are the biggest problems with growing more organic seed in the United States, they're, they've nailed down a couple things. One is training enough farmers, and Organic Seed Alliance is doing that, along with groups like uh, the Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association. Got a bunch of great things out there helping to support our local seed growers here. Um, Chris Hardy's the president of that. A lot of the board is in this room. Um, but they were also, one of the big things was there was too much contamination going on with the vegetable seeds in most of the country. And things like this are what's saving these seed sanctuaries. And I don't know, I heard somewhere today that um, with Josephine and Jackson, Jackson County together, this is one of the largest areas of seed sanctuary without genetically modified organisms in the country, if not the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of people studying that. And if it wasn't for the people in this room and the, the, all the work that everyone here has done, we wouldn't have that opportunity. Um, what we're seeing is a lot of farmers in this area getting really excited about growing seed, and more and more farmers, uh, the Organic Seed Alliance alone, the organic farmers out there, 95% want to get into growing commercial seed organically. But they're not able to for one reason or another. And people like this, places like this, allow organic farmers to save their seed without the, without the genetic uh, contamination that's been going on. So, um, yeah, all right. Well, there it is. I'll pass it over to Elise. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. So, yeah, it's really exciting to see that um, there is such a demand. And, um, and, and the idea that the commercial growers at a larger scale, over 10 acres, are really needing more seed. And so tonight, it's all about connecting you with these seed farmers. Because you see a lot of vegetable um, growers at the market and fruit growers, but you don't always see the faces of the seed farmers. So I'd like to just um, get a chance to be able to talk to talk about them later and get you to answer some questions and ask them questions and they can tell you a little bit about what they're doing. But first I wanted to tell you about what we're doing with our Family Farms Coalition. So we've been really, really busy. We have been, um, we met oh, a couple of years ago just as the campaign was you know, getting into action, and I remember Chris getting a phone call from Chris saying, Elise, you've got to come to this meeting. <laughs> We've got to get the farmers united on this, right? So we all got together, and a bunch of farmers ended up like, I think the fries pushed me out of my seat and made me volunteer. <laughs> they paid the hundred dollars to file to get incorporated, and then there it was. So, um, anyways, here we are. That night, there was farmers from all over, both Josephine and Jackson County, and. I've said this before, but just to remind people in the room that you know our main focus was um, to get Jackson County's ballot measure passed, and it was just amazing to see the community come together um, in Jackson and Josephine County to work on that, and it just was such a, a privilege, and I have so much gratitude to be able to work on that campaign with all of you and to 
set this national precedent. I was giving a, a, a talk <coughs> interview to a radio show back east um, the day before yesterday, and he says, you know, this is in the Washington Post. This is like national news. This is really big information. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I know, it is. It's amazing. I can't believe we created this, right? So um, just, you know, thank you to all of you for what you've created. And so when we were at that meeting, we said, let's focus on Jackson County. And if we can, like, actually make this happen, because everyone thought we couldn't, right? They were trying to get, you know, political, um, people with political background in to run the campaign, but nobody in their right mind would do it because they didn't want that on their uh, resume. To lose it. And so they were like, at least your farmer doesn't matter what you do, you can go ahead and do it. So, so that's how I got into this um, spot. But we said afterwards, if we get this passed in Jackson County, then we have to get the rest of the county's rights back in Oregon. As most of you know that when um, Chris and Brian and all of you got those um, signatures put in, um, there was 863 that was passed, and it took all the rest of Oregon's county's rights away to vote on GE issues. And that is just, was unbelievable. And that gave even more pressure to all of us in Jackson County to get this passed because we had this opportunity, right? We were like, this is our only opportunity. Nobody else has this. This is crazy. So we decided, um, except for um, Josephine County, who went rogue, <laughs> the true rogue valley. Um, so um, anyway, so we are working on that. And we um, I was joking with uh, Julia McFadden, who's now working with Bates. And I don't think she's here, because she's on her way up to Salem tonight. But um, she said, Elise, how did you get this bill going with, um, you know, with Holby? And I said, well, Basically, we lobbied the lobbyist. <laughs> we went to the lobbyist that we knew, which was Friends of Family Farmers, and Ivan. And we said, Ivan, what are you doing next session at the short session? He was like, well, I'm not really sure. We're doing listening sessions and this and that. And I said, well, really the work to do is to uh, overturn 863, because that's a joke. And he was like, uh, well, I guess so. That's it. And I said, we will be behind you 100% if you can make that happen. So both of us tried to talk with different representatives and. He worked his wonders with Holby, and um, Holby talked with us and interviewed, and we got this bill now that's going to be in the short session. So I'm just so like proud that we got this far, and I'll be up in Salem all next week, and I've been up a couple weeks ago, and um, we'll have a hearing in the next couple weeks, and this bill, I hope we'll see it last through the rest of February and pass and give the rest of Oregon back its um, rights to go on judicial <laughs> I mean, it was funny, I was on a phone call the other day and someone said, oh, we must have known that our family farms was involved because all this commotion is happening, <laughs> happening with the representatives. They said, we can't believe how many emails have been pouring in. And as you know, when we got this bill, up Holby's bill, it was being put um, back and forth, as they say, they were playing you know, political baseball with this bill, like who was going to, what committee was going to get it. And because of all of your emails and calls, it actually went back and forth and back and forth. It was in rural lands for a while behind the scenes, and then it got back put to um, consumer protection. So thank you, all of you. It's such a huge It just shows you the power of the people. Anyways, so um, we will be, um, I, will, I will be up there. <laughs> And Ivan, and um, I'm hoping to recruit some of you to come up when we have the hearing that's still to be um, the date to be um, announced. So they like to do things last minute, so we don't have to there. But um, so, yeah, we're just working on getting members, and tonight we're really excited to announce also that we do have, if you want to make your donations to um, support the work, the advocacy work, and the education side of things, and we also have a 501c3 status. Really excited about it. So, your, a couple days ago. <laughs> so your donations tonight can be tax deductible if you want. Um, and uh, to know that if you always donate to the um, Our Family Farms Coalition, that money is not limited to political work. So we always like that also. And um, what else do I need to talk about? I have a membership table is right inside to the left. Oh, thank you, Christina. Yeah. <laughs> So we have, yeah, so we have membership, and I think Anne's going to talk a little bit about our membership tonight, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm talking faster than they anticipated, so I'm off schedule a little bit, but that's okay. So I'm going to introduce Mary Middleton from Josephine County, who's going to give us a little update on what's happening in Joko. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you, Elise, for inviting me here, and for all of you for being here. And um, thank you, Jeff, for stealing my line. <laughs> <laughs> I love to talk about how together Josephine and Jackson County created the largest GE free zone in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep saying it. Exactly. So in Josephine County, uh, Borgonians for Safe Farms and Families is the organization that um, I'm the director of. And we are really focused on legal defense because we are in the midst of litigation. Uh, and we're also recently been granted 501c4 status. So that allows us to do political action work. Uh, so that's it. And we also have GMO Free Josephine County alive and well, and it is a 501c3 as well. Um, so we focus education efforts through GMO Free Josephine County, and we still have the Food Integrity Project going on where we are highlighting uh, local restaurants and local food providers who are providing food with integrity. So that's alive and well, and I encourage you to check out those websites. I wanted to make sure and also say to Jackson County, congratulations on the settlement that was just happening that is uh, precedent, nationally precedent-setting settlement that's fantastic. <laughs> and we want to work on HB 4122. Um, just to be clear, in Josephine County, uh, we believe that SB 863 is overreaching, illegal, and does not apply to us. Um, in terms of our litigation, so if you don't know the background, probably most of you do, but there is a uh, farmer in Josephine County suing, suing for the right to grow genetically engineered crops. And the county attorney uh, basically said that uh, he wasn't sure what to do about that. And so uh, our attorney, Stephanie Dolan, is here, one of our attorneys. Yeah. And, uh, Melissa Wisherath with Sustain uh, Center for Sustainability Law uh, are working together, and they've been working quite hard. We are in the midst, midst of uh, discovery. The, um, we were granted intervener status as Oregonians for Safe Farms and Families and Siskiyou Seeds, Don Tipping, Siskiyou Seeds, the rest of you, seed growers know Don well. Um, so, the discovery is happening now and the legal briefs will be turned in February 19th, which is another reason why our attorneys are hard at work, finalizing all of those details. And we have a summary judgment hearing scheduled for March 11th. So we invite you all to show up in your Sunday best and support us in Josephine County because we want to keep that largest GE zone in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as a political action group, I'm involved with uh, the National Coalition of States, which is kind of a GMO action alliance, uh, mostly um, throughout the United States, Florida, uh, Connecticut, a lot of eastern states, and California, Pam Larry is um, a member and a board member. And um, we've been doing a lot of talking about the TPP. How many of you have heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Oh, yeah. Um, it was recently released. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to read the entire thing. It's 6,000 pages long and 30 chapters. Um, there are 12 countries who are expected to sign that. Uh, within the week, and including the United States. President, President Obama is scheduled to go to, I believe, New Zealand is the latest place where they're going to have that little meeting. And that would nullify any GE free zone, and it would do a lot of other things. So we're going to be um, putting out some educational stuff. So I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter, and to watch our Facebook pages, and to keep uh, doing what you're doing and fighting a good fight, and I thank you very much for your support. That's something to be proud of. So, um, so a little bit of work um, on the national level for those of you that, that aren't up to date. I think before we, um, I can't remember when we all met and did a meeting, who we talked to and who we didn't. 
But um, just to remind you all that we have, our Family Farms Coalition has also been um, to D.C. a few times um, in the last year. And part of that uh, national effort has been on the national labeling front and just trying to have a voice um, in the White House and letting um, these representatives and congressmen uh, and senators uh, know about, hear a voice from a different side of the farming industry, right? You go down the halls and it's just like one soybean grower, corn grower association from another and little teeny farmers, future farmers of America in suits. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I, need to, I need to talk to them <laughs> without their parents. So, um, <laughs> so our, voice, our voice really needs to be heard out there. And so the work and, and money that you put in to be a member um, helps that voice uh, being heard. And um, there's just, you know, talking with Ivan from Friends and Family Farmers is one of the only lobbyists like really up there for the organic and traditional farmer. And so, um, you know, in the Salem side, and that's not even really the national side. So we are really um, not heard as a voice because we're not present up there. So it's important that we are, and we're looking into um, getting actually, you know, professional people up there as well. But it's important that all of us are vocal and we can see um, with our movement and with our action, if it's in a positive um, way, that we can get um, action happening in, in a manner that is fair and respectful. So um, I encourage all of you to stay involved and um, supporting the work that we're doing. And um, we do have members already in maybe seven different states of farmers that came, or actually maybe more like 11 different states, I guess, um, Farmers that have said they'd like to be representatives for our Family Farms Coalition in other states because they want to see this going in their state so that when people. <laughs> when we were in DC and we um, brought 15 different farmers up there um, to talk and to talk about the national labeling and how it actually benefits farmers who are growing food that the consumers want that they're able to you know, show with transparency and not some code mark on the back that their food is GE free or GMO free, um, that this actually helped us as, as family farmers and farmers that were growing food, non-GE food, traditional food. And just for them to be just, like, we don't have that support. Like, it was so interesting to talk to farmers. And I mean, it was really disheartening too to know that they didn't have that support group like we have here. And the farming that they were really alone. Like some of them said, we're surrounded by GE farmers and we feel so isolated. And we're, I mean, they still email me from here because they're in Iowa and they don't have, you know, wherever they are in different states and they're reaching out to our family farms. So I feel like we really can be that vessel for people and the more we can infiltrate throughout the states, it's going to get stronger. And maybe Chris can briefly talk a little bit about his work when he was back home. That would be good too. So, um, Ann Golden, board member from our family farm school. I'm sure most of you uh, know, this, know this lovely face already, but um, this is a mover and shaker behind the scenes, because if it wasn't for Ann, we would have not had the funding that we had to win the campaign. funding because of every person sitting in this room. So I don't support, please. Yeah. I know, that's so true. And I will say, I just got back from a meeting in Austin, Texas this week, and we were looking at farming and food issues across the country. And somebody approached me, his name is Rufo, he lives in Paris, and he said, Ann, how's the lawsuit coming? And I said, oh, you know about the lawsuit. And um, I'll tell you, Jackson County really is not just on the national map. There are people, a lot of people in Mexico, and you know, all across North America, and really in Europe too, so it's a big deal. So I just wanted to uh, thank everybody. When I look at the faces, I just want to cry, you know, because you all, you know, canvassed and made phone calls and had house parties, you know, not just for the ballot measure, but for the lawsuit too, so thank you so, so much. Um, so I'm here not just to announce recess, but to say that next month is the four-year anniversary that our beloved Chris Hardy found those beats. Yeah. And a quick synopsis, you know, when he, when he went to the county, county didn't do anything, and invited Syngenta, and they walked out of the room and said, sorry, it doesn't fit our business model. 
So, um, so it was all of you. So thus the ballot measure. And, um, and what a community and what a network it is. So as Elise said, you know, the work continues. There was no room for complacency in this movement. I mean, we need rafter eyes and ears. We need to be hawk and eagle and really keep an eye out for whatever's going to come our way. And we know that here, you know, we've had great victories, but you can't sit on that because anything can happen. And we know that there's a threat statewide and nationally. Yes. And so, and we have multinational chemical corporations who their drive for um, profitability really is almost blinding. And it's, um, and it doesn't matter whether we're, up, we're on the radar screen or not. So we really are working vigilantly and Elise is doing an amazing job as everybody else, you know, to really, you know, keep the engine going. And um, so that's why I'm, inviting every person here uh, to sign up as a, a, a member. It's an annual thing, and I think that the basic membership is $25, and five lattes, that's what that is. And, uh, and so, but we really, you know, that it matters. When we say, oh, you can say how many likes you have on Facebook, or how many people are looking at that, but when you have actual members, and if the numbers are just, it's not 50 or 150, but when you have 1,200 members, and half of those are farmers, and so many are outside of Jackson County. It really, in addition to Jackson County, it matters. So there's a table across uh, on the other side of the hall, and if you can possibly do it tonight, and if not at another time, we would love to have your name as a member of our family farms. It would mean a lot to us going forward. And if you have friends and family, it's a great gift for someone's birthday. Hey, you're, you remember now? And I just discovered this. This is the most amazing thing. We have these bags at the table. And this is a beautiful picture of Vandana. It's a painting. It's an image of a painting. And our dear friend Magdalena, um, or Rosa Abia, and he is now the executive director of like the Innocence Project in Pennsylvania. He's doing this really big work for um, changing how people, trying to get people unincarcerated, I guess if that's a word. And then these beautiful bags. I mean, it's like $10 for bags or something like that. So we are not making money on these bags, I can tell you that. But your membership is everything. Your name matters. And so all the work that you do, if you could um, you know, join with us you know, for 2016, it just would mean a lot to us. So, um, so thank you very, very much. And thank you, Chris, for launching all of us four years ago. And, um, and uh, the journey continues. So there's going to be lots of time for Q&A. We have super organic and gluten-free snacks that will be on the table in about three minutes. And, um, and so, and the food truck will also be out there, which is, has amazing, it's a soup kitchen. Nice yeah. soups, yeah. So thanks. So, yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, okay. you're welcome. Thanks. actually traveling up to the um, Organic Seed Alliance and some of our other, I think everybody on the panel will be at, at the Organic Seed Alliance, right? Yeah. Teaching and chocolate. We're going to have chocolate there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, Jeff told you a little bit about the Save the Seed report. That was kind of a, a snapshot of some of the work that they do. And um, we were really excited and honored um, to be asked to present about the work that we've done in Jackson County and how we um, ignited the community on fire and got this um, seed sanctuary going. So we're really excited to talk to farmers. How many farmers will be there? Like 700? 800. 800 seed farmers from across the Biggest one ever. Wow. Ever. So that's huge. So that's really exciting. So we're going to talk about that. Talking about the importance of um, you know, farmers just making that dedication of time to step out of their fields and um, have their voice be heard about how important this is to the future of our agricultural um, and traditional seed supply. So, um, you know, one of the one of the um, ideas of tonight was just to kind of connect you with some of these faces that that I'm lucky enough that I get to know and work with all these people that some of you don't um, get to see the work that they're doing behind the scenes and to really. Um, you know, just kind of set that 
idea that um, seed farming is you know quite different than um, growing for product bringing to um, for the fruit or the, or the vegetable or the commodity or the food itself so um, they have a whole other side of things and they need your support as well and it's just good to know the importance and the, the demand that we have um, nationally and internationally and um, Barbara corrected me earlier as she often does and said that um, we should remember, and we, um, Mary and I actually stand right that we are the largest seed sanctuary in the continental U.S. Yeah. 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 The only is, um, well, Hawaii, but they have papaya, so they have an exemption for uh, she eats papaya. Yeah. I, yeah. I just, you know, that I work with Access, and there was a mother nut squash seed. We're going to tell about that story, so oh, don't. Okay. <laughs> 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 but I'm glad that you're doing that, and I'm glad you're excited about that. So um, tonight we have um, Andrew Schwartz from Ridgeline Meadows Farm, one of our newest farmer members here, and Chris Hardy, who you all know and love. Stand up, farmers, stand up. So, <laughs> Chris Hardy, Jonathan Sparrow, Lupin Noel, and Chuck Burr from Restoration so the reason we invited them here tonight is just to give you a glimpse and kind of share into maybe what um, you know brings them to um, farming uh, for seed and what draws them because it's not so easy, right? It is really difficult. And um, so I just want to tell them a little bit something to highlight about their work and, and what they're doing to kind of give you an idea of, of what they're up to. So um, I guess Chuck is first on the list here. Chuck, we're going to share so maybe just give a little introduction, brief introduction of who you are, what you do, and... Okay. Um, Restoration Seeds is an, an online uh, up, seed company. We, um, we sell 1,000 going on 1,100 varieties of open pollinated seeds. Um, that's an important distinction um, for your food sovereignty. Um, people have, we've heard the terms GM or genetically engineered seeds. Everybody knows that, right? And then there's something called hybrid seeds. And then there's something called open pollinated seeds. Now the distinction between hybrid and open pollinated is that you can, um, you have your food sovereignty when you have an open pollinated seed, which means it can be saved and regrown true to type from the, from the original parent. Um, a hybrid seed, since you don't have the two original parents, you can't save your seeds from. Um, so our market niche is to bring to the marketplace and add visibility and dollars to the seed farmers that grow the open pollinated seeds because the hybrid seeds might be more uniform or this or that, but the genetic diversity um, and adaptability is in the open pollinated seeds. And you as a customer can't save your seeds unless you have open pollinated seeds. So that's our market niche. And how many farms and how is that? We have, we have 50 farmers we buy from um, around the country, around the world. Um, we have nearly 1,100 varieties we ship worldwide. Um, our business grows from about 30 to 100 percent a year. So it's, it's fun watching as it goes. But people want their food sovereignty. We're in National Dorica. And they have a good pick. Oh yeah, we have a couple of acres. <laughs> Anything else I forgot? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Right. Okay, my daughter Bridget's over there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jonathan Spiro. Uh, I have Lupin Noah Farm and uh, I grow vegetable seed and I do some breeding in sweet corn and in brassicas. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, intellectual property rights as they affect seed and then uh, talking about the Open Source Seed Initiative, which is an alternative to those IPR protections. I am Chris Hardy, um, representing Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association and farming at Mindful Earth Farm. And I've uh, served on the board of the Royal Valley Growers and Crafters Market for four years here in the Valley, helping our farmers find markets for their products. And um, 
and have been involved in the Road Valley Farm to School program for virtually all of the 10 years that I've been in the Road Valley. Um, before it was even the Road Valley Farm to School program, it was the Eagle Mill Farm Education Project. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, and uh, yeah, um, just my life has just been getting sucked away here into the whole GMO realm since I walked into this field of sugar beets uh, four years ago, as uh, Elise and Ann uh, shared earlier, and, uh, and come to find out there's a lot of, a lot of folks and a lot of farm, farming communities across the United States that are really uh, uh, interested to understand how they can protect their communities' um, uh, seed supply from unwanted uh, uh, contamination from the patent. Uh, seeds that, that these biotech corporations that uh, tried so hard to defeat our measure in Josephine and Jackson County did. And, um, and so, um, so I was excited to travel to Montana here just over the winter and spent uh, the, the, the two holidays up in Montana and uh, got to speak to some folks in Bozeman, Montana, some farmers up there, and uh, also uh, uh, one of the local community efforts, um, a nonprofit in Virginia City, Montana, uh, uh, invited me to speak, invited, invited our Family Farms Coalition <laughs> to speak at, at this event to share our Jackson County uh, experience. And, uh, and it was a packed room, and I was like, just so, like, it was like, holy cow, this is where my, my niece and nephew live, and where my brothers and mother and father grow and save their seeds. And, it was just really um, heartening to know that even out there in Montana, where uh, even GMO alfalfa growers just down the road from my mother and father, um, you know, just literally a couple miles away, GMO alfalfa was grown just about uh, two years ago. And pretty much everybody who was growing GE alfalfa in the, in the Ruby Valley and the Beaverhead Valley um, just outside of Yellowstone Park, outside of Bozeman, Montana area, where my, my family lives, um, uh, have decided to stop growing such. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to know that a lot of the wheat growers there are not interested in GMO wheat either, because they understand the ramifications of being able to uh, claim their product as non-GMO. And as we know with the Eastern Oregon wheat uh, discovery there, that um, is a tricky en endeavor when you start to talk about coexistence and getting everybody doing what they're doing, you know, GMO and non-GMO all together. And so I think, think it's, it's been a wake-up call, uh, also a discovery in Montana shortly after we discovered GE wheat. And Eastern Oregon, they discovered it also in Montana. So. Um, it's, it's the aha moment and kind of we're at the fork of the road for those communities who want to choose that. And so I'm grateful to be here and grateful that uh, there's such a, uh, an awesome amount of people in our community that care so much about their food and continue to show up for these important things to talk about our seeds. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> um, so Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association, um, uh, we have, I believe, seven on our board. Is that right? Seven of us in total. Yep. And uh, really awesome farmers who are, uh, who have been saving their seeds for many years and who are um, uh, interested to continue pushing, uh, you know, pushing uh, for economic opportunities for our farmers in Southern Oregon, and um, we got a grant, actually it was a Western SARE grant uh, about a year ago, I believe it was, and this grant has allowed Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association to develop educational programs for our uh, aspiring young farmers and established farmers who are looking to transition to, uh, to seed production. And so, um, um, uh, we, we had a number of uh, programs that were lined up uh, last year that, that um, uh, we toured farms. Um, we actually had uh, seed companies come down to Southern Oregon to, to talk directly to our farmers who were interested to 
grow seeds and uh, uh, assure them that there were economic opportunities for them and, um, and uh, that they were ready to, to, to develop relationships with them to start developing high quality uh, seeds for, for um, their seed companies. And understand that most of these conversations that are being had are in a lot of ways about local. And local um, could mean 100 miles. Um, we have a lot of work to do here as we do import nearly 97% of all food to the Rogue Valley. Everything that we all eat is, is virtually imported to us from hundreds if not thousands of miles away. So it's really important to have these discussions ongoing about what the future of our food looks like. But as co of course, as we now all in our awakening understand the, the, uh, the, the, the virtual uh, the battles that we have fought between Josephine and Jackson County for our right to be able to protect our, our farmers' seeds and our seed savers' seeds from uh, the, the threats that genetically engineered crops pose. We have uh, started down a way that will allow us to continue to do that and develop an economic opportunity for those who believe in the open pollinated uh, seeds that, that many of our farmers grow and do save. And um, let's see here, we have an event. So we, we are, uh, like Elise said, Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association, we're, we're going to be, repre uh, be represented up at the Organic Seed Alliance Conference um, in Corvallis next weekend. And uh, we're going to be sharing um, the experience that we had in Southern Oregon with, uh, with the big uh, chemical company that was here that walked out of our Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association meeting. And they walked out of county. And, and, then, and they, they are out of our county indeed. And uh, uh, so we have uh, Dr. Bill Tracy who's coming down from the University of Minnesota. He's going to be here on the 7th of February. For those of you who can make it, that's going to be at the OSU uh, SOREC building. SOREC at... Uh, at the extension building in Central Point on Hanley Road at, I believe that's 6 o'clock? Sunday at 6. Sunday at 4. 4 to 6? 4. Do you know where it is? Jeff? Whatever. You can, we'll put it on a newsletter and the newsletter comes out. Uh, yeah, I, think if I just had, I was looking at that. 4 yeah. to 6. Four, 4 to 6. 4 to 6. Thank you, Mary. But it's going to be geared towards... Yeah, so it's going to be, it's, you know, not just like a broad discussion about seeds. It's, it's a discussion for seed growers and those who are interested in working with seed directly to develop uh, better quality seed systems <coughs> for our farmers. And so, um, uh, so it's going to be a topic on seed breeding. And uh, Dr. Bill Tracy is just like amazing and he's been working with a lot of of uh, the Organic Seed Alliance and uh, Native Seed Search and others across the country in uh, getting our farmers trained and helping to develop an alternative uh, to, um, like um, Jeff was sharing earlier, Jeff Higley was sharing earlier that the, uh, the, the, the our, that we have a, a big, a huge shortfall in the availability of high quality organic seeds to be used for these systems that are not designed to be used with the NPK chemical systems that, you know, virtually you go to get a seed off the seed rack, that's what you're going to be planting, is something that was designed in intelligently to be used with synthetic fertilizers. So that's, that's just a little bit of insight why it's so vitally important that we work towards developing an alternative to that, no less uh, to be able to meet the needs of our certified organic seed growers that we have here in Southern Oregon that are currently not able to, to be able to source or find seeds uh, that are certified organic. So many times just having to go um, get, get seeds that are conventionally produced and, and um, nearly it, like a Johnny Selected Seeds, one of the largest market uh, purveyor of seeds in the whole United States that virtually probably everybody in this room has heard of Johnny's seeds of Maine, they uh, source virtually 75 or what is it, up to 80% now of their seeds from China. 
So, you know, how, how adapted are already those uh, to bring into our, our area here to plant? You know, they're, they're, they're not, they're about as far away as, as we could anticipate. So, um, other than that, um, let's see here, just I'm trying to think to wrap up. Uh, an annual meeting coming up here this month. Thank you, Jeff. On the uh, 23rd? 24th or 5th? 24th. It's Wednesday. I, I just looked at it. <laughs> okay, so Tuesday the 23rd at 6 p.m. at Hanley, um, at the Hanley Center. If you're interested in becoming a member of the Southern Oregon Sea Growers Association, please show up at the, at the uh, OSU, SA, OSU Extension, Hanley, Hanley Road on the 23rd of Tuesday. Um, and if you're interested, you could also sign up on, we have a list over a clipboard over on a table to the right as you walk into the big room if you want to be added to our email list, and we'll keep you in the loop. Um, and, and there's going to be a seed exchange that's happening sometime late March, early April that's in, in uh, progress right now, so stay tuned to that, and if you want to be kept in the loop on that, uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, show up at the seed growers meeting or um, show up. Uh, put your name on that list and we'll keep you updated on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So before, I introduce, before Andrew talks, I'm going to have Jonathan talk a little bit about what, you, what your experience has been on seed breeding and then we'll bring it to Andrew and then we'll open it to questions and answers. Okay. Is that okay? Uh, well, I was going to speak some on intellectual property restrictions sure. as they affect seed growers and farmers and plant breeders. Um, and then I'm going to preach the gospel of the open source seed initiative and of open source seed, which is something relatively new and uh, now available from a couple of dozen sources, including one right here. <coughs> uh, intellectual property restrictions, there's different types of intellectual property restrictions, and I think we have to start there. Prior to 1970, all seed was in the public domain. You bought seed, you owned it, uh, you could do what you wanted with it. Uh, in 1970, the Plant Variety Protection Act was passed. Uh, this is a good law in some ways. The problem with everything being in the public domain is that I might spend 20 years perfecting this corn and somebody can take it, essentially take it from the Plant Variety Protection Act uh, allows for exclusive sales for a period of years, but importantly, it does not restrict plant breeding, it does not restrict saving seed, and so the, uh, the wheels of, of development keep going. You can take that, you can save the seed, you can improve it, you can cross it, etc. And so it's a mixed bag. It's a restriction from the point of view of a seed grower. You can't just take a PVP variety and, and uh, start producing it for sale, at least not within the period of that PVP. But you can take it and work and improve it. You can cross it with something else and sell it. Now, in 1980, all this changed. In 1980, plant patents became legal. <coughs> Uh, now, a plant patent is uh, different than a PVP. Plant patents are more restrictive. The uh, patented seed is essentially owned by the seed company, or the seed uh, owned the patent owner. You're essentially renting that seed. You can't breed with it. You can't save the seed from it. Uh, and so, patents were intended to foster uh, innovation or reward innovation. And, but instead, in the case of plants, they become an impediment. All of a sudden, these are no longer available for breeding. Uh, <clears throat> even more problematic than the, uh, those patents is they're now taking and have approved some patents on broad plant traits. These include red coloration in lettuce. Uh, they include an extruded head in broccoli, which is something my solstice broccoli has, and uh, Oregon State University is fighting this because they spent 25 years developing uh, an extruded head broccoli, and all of a sudden they're being told that their own work is no longer legal, it's not theirs, it's been patented. Uh, 
The same is true of, of nutrient contents. High anthocyanin in carrots and lycopene in carrots are all have patent applications. So this is something of a problem. They cut off access to crop development and uh, <clears throat> if these stand, we've got, we've got a problem. Uh, red lettuce is patented, means you can't grow le red lettuce. Uh, <laughs> good start. Huh? Now when you couple this with the uh, seed industry con uh, consolidation and the adding gene sequences or GMOs, you've got an even greater problem. Uh, it's important to remember, we didn't create anything from scratch. Uh, I may be able to produce a, a corn that's a little better than what it came from, but that builds on, on thousands of years of people breeding corn before. Uh, however, with a patent, and especially with industry consolidation, one can uh, lose all of that. Uh, and the, the effect of genetic engineering on that, I will say, it's easier to put something in, insert a gene into a plant than it is to take it back out. <laughs> so if you're a company who can add a gene, whatever that is, useful or otherwise, and then patent that, you, you own that patent on that crop. If you can then buy out the competition, the little family seed companies, and take the other non-genetic form off the market, you effectively control that crop and you eliminate all the uh, breeding that, that's gone before. <clears throat> so there's the challenge of IPR. Uh, the, uh, sometimes, sometimes a PVP is not a bad idea. I'm not against plant variety protection. Uh, sometimes it's a, you know, it's, it's a, a fair exchange for the work that's been done. But what I'm going to talk about is open source seed, which is not compatible. The open source seed initiative is relatively new. Uh, open source seeds are essentially unrestricted and they're owned by the grower. The open source pledge and the breeder of a variety would pledge a variety to open source. The open source pledge simply says, you have the freedom to use these Aussie pledge seeds in any way you choose. In return, you pledge not to restrict other use, others' use of these seeds or their derivatives by patents or other means, and to include this pledge with any transfer of these seeds or their derivatives. Now, the or their de derivatives uh, becomes important. The concept of open source software says if you create coding, you can free its use and commit it to open source. If you use a sequence of open source uh, software, you owe no one, but you commit that new software to be likewise available. The free carries forward. Now, as applied to seed, if you use an open source variety to create something new, the new variety must also be open to being freely used, shared, and approved by others. So it's viral, it keeps going forward. Um, Pledging seeds to open source is the highest level of protecting the interest of the public. And as every plant breeder is breeding on the work of centuries that came before, as I said, this merely passes on that gift with whatever added improvements uh, we've made. <clears throat> so this wasn't really necessary before intellectual property rights became possible. Everything was in the public domain. In the public domain, uh, any seed was essentially owned by that grower, could be used, saved, improved, sold. But today, that's, that's different. Uh, now, open source pledging, I'm going to talk a little bit about how that works. It does allow contracting. So if I develop a seed, a lot of plant breeders are not going to be able to grow seed in the quantity that the market demand. I can still contract with, with someone else to blow up that seed as a product of acreage. But once I sell that seed to you, or I sell that seed to a seed company that sells it to you, 
there, uh, I can no longer place restrictions on it. And that seed and that seed's derivatives enter this pool of open source. There are now, the Open Source Seed Initiative is less than two years old. We have more than 250 varieties pledged by the plant breeders to open source. We have 26 seed companies who are now partners with the Open Source Seed Initiative who are selling and promoting open source seed. Uh, it doesn't limit what farmers' choices are with others. A farmer can still choose to buy patented seed, rented seed, and we don't affect that. What we're trying to do, or what we're doing, is creating an alternative body of seed uh, that is pledged to the future and pledged to open source. So anyone who develops a new variety, makes a new cross, is invited to uh, pledge that seed to open source. And the Open Source Seed Initiative was developed to catalog those to, uh, we have, uh, plant breeders who review and make sure that the person pledging has the right to do so. And also we maintain a list and a list of seed companies that carry these seeds. So those are available to the public. And uh, um, what else should I say here? You got one minute. I got one minute. <laughs> I better write that. Uh, Open Source Seed Initiative also partners with uh, businesses from other areas of the food industry. Good Earth Stores in Sonoma is now a partner. They are featuring open source seeds, and uh, we are developing partnerships with organizations in other nations. We've got a group in Germany and a group in India who are now doing essentially the same thing. So uh, that's the Open Source Seed Initiative. That's the alternative. Uh, to learn more, the website is osseeds.org, www.ossseeds.org, and uh, there there are forms for pledging, submitting, becoming a seed company partner, becoming a uh, food partner, etc. corn seed over there in the yeah. seed market. <laughs> so, last but not least, All right. it's Andrew. Um, well, I'm representing the Green Corn Beginner Farmer here on the panel. <laughs> um, after working on farms for the last five years, I landed here last summer or last spring, got a piece of land out the Apple Gate and had an interest in growing seed and all of the work you guys had done laying the GMO Food Sanctuary had already had begun. So I am now playing kind of catch up and trying to get on board in as many ways as possible. Um, I landed on the Soska board as well, helping that organization move forward with the research project and mentorships, which we're going to continue this next season. Looking, if anybody has any ideas, I think Chuck might have got the form for this year on the Saska website, um, or will be working on it. If you know anybody who wants to be mentored or someone who wants to mentor a young seed grower, we're looking for those hookups this year. Um, I'm also into orchardry as well. Planted a small <coughs> orchard of trees and partnered with some other orchards around the area. Um, it's just a really important avenue to pursue. The seeds are the fundamental basis for all the farm work that we do, all the food that we eat, and it's going to be a lifelong passion to keep this moving forward and keep our seeds in our own hands and let us keep growing our own food. So, yeah. Could you share how you discovered that your beet crop was contaminated? So, stand up. Hopefully, no one said that I had a contaminated crop tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I often got that. Yeah, I, I can't really talk about a lawsuit so much, but uh, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it's the question. The question is like, well, is it true that you were contaminated? Is that why you did this? Like, where's the proof? Where's the tests? Okay, so the tests are... Um, um, I just heard Andrew Kimbrell, Center for Food Safety, talk about this a few days ago. And what he said at, was, as of like 2012, as early as, there really wasn't any cases to really talk about. Who got contaminated? They didn't want it. Where were they? How much did it cost them? There was really no cases on the ground that we could talk about and refer to. But now, some several years on, even just uh, with the last uh, the last couple of years, uh, the the corn corn alone, China turned back six billion dollars worth of like no, we said we don't want what you got that GMO stuff. We want the other stuff. That's what we asked for. Where is it? Because they tested it and it came up positive to have GMO in it. So, you know, that's, that's what we know from, from our Rogue Valley in our Southern Oregon case is that um, it's just the threat of contamination, just the possibility that some pollen could get into your crop and you not know it. And your customers are like, is this GMO or is this not? You know, so here I was down in off of Siskiyou Boulevard growing right between two syngenta fields one of which was up in Tolman Creek, and the other was, was down on Normal Avenue, which was the field that I walked into. And I'm like, wow, this one's about an eighth of a mile away, and this one's maybe quarter, maybe half mile away. So I'm surrounded by, you know, which way's the wind gonna blow? Up the valley, down the valley, you know? Am I gonna test my seeds? Well, sure, because I care about my customers who demand no GMO in their seed. So that would have put me at uh, risk for, or not at risk, but put, put the burden on me to have to test my seed to prove that it had no GMO uh, content in it. And that would have, and, and if it would have had any, you know, any amount of trace contamination in it, I mean, who in this room would like to buy some of my, my, my beet seeds that got just a little bit of GMO? <laughs> They're just a little pat. <laughs> You know, like basically can't save the seed, you know, so that's, that's legally. Right, so you decided to go off of scientific studies and stop the project because you didn't want to invest another year of your time because it's a biannual crop. So he would have had to spend another two years or another year after the whole year of his land, his resources, and his time and then test when chances were pretty good based on scientific studies that the crop would have come out with contamination. So he was a smart businessman, decided to abandon that project and then make the county GMO free. That's, that's right. Chris, you know, also Syngenta was growing. Sir, can you fill out with it? Illegally, Syngenta has been licensed to keep it four miles away from conventional crops. Right. And they were across the street from organic farmers everywhere. In right. So at that time, they weren't compliant with the regulations, but then we were told that, well, that's kind of changed recently. So they, we, we were told in July of 2012 that they fully deregulated it. We needed to just get over it and let the past be the past. But the fact was, <laughs> as Brian points out, they were likely illegal in their, uh, their growing of them across the valley next to farmers throughout the entire Rogue Valley, Josephine, and Jackson County. So, um, so thanks, Chris. One, I wanted to acknowledge our uh, Master Gardeners in the room here. If you're a Master Woo! Gardeners program, stand up. Woo! Come on, there's some Master Gardeners out there. Um, so this question is, considering our need to grow more food locally, does seed growing use a lot of land? That could be used to grow food instead. So I'm going to let Chuck answer that question. Um, the, the, multiplica the, the multiplication of seed is staggering. When we were visiting the cabbage fields in Washington about four years ago, one acre of cabbage seed is about 18,000 acres of cabbage. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like this big compared to, to and, and, and it's, it's seeds have longer shelf life. They're transportable around the world or around the country and like a cabbage is. 
you know what I mean? So it's economically, it's really good for the valley. And um, that's how these companies control the market space. Because I actually looked it up. We, gross, we eat something like 70,000 acres or 90,000 acres of cabbage in the country. And if one acre is 18,000 acres, how many acres of cabbage seed does it take to corner <laughs> the cabbage question. seed market? It's like four or five acres. So that's how these companies are trying to control the marketplace. And mind you, most of the cabbage seed is grown in the state of Washington. So in the Skagit Valley. So it's like, right, where's the cabbage seed? Grow? You know, you just like put the plot on the map and say right there. If you're, the, if you're the business guy that wants to control the world's seed, you focus your energy right in on that little pinpoint for the whole U.S. cabbage. And then you could do that for, you know, the potato. You could do that for the, you know, whatever, name your vegetable, you could, or your wheat or your grain or whatever. That's how, how these guys are doing it. So yeah, and I also want to mention, I mean, that is the beauty of seed production here in Southern Oregon and so for some of these small farms is that it doesn't take a lot of land. Um, and it's an economically, um, you know, viable business decision for people. So that's why so many farmers, along with farming food, they also have some seed production. And it makes a lot of sense. Not only is there the need, um, but economically it's a, a smart decision to get some extra cash flow. I think the average seed, I don't know, can somebody have some economics on that, like some numbers on the average seed crop can yield compared to the vegetable crop? What's looking at me? Four or five times. Yeah, you went from ten thousand to eighty thousand. Right, so ten to eighty thousand. So it's a it's a good decision to you know to make. So that's why it is important, and that's why we stepped up to protect the seed production, not only economically, and that's really what they seem to care about in um, you know Salem and D.C. So that's a good argument as far as you know that it's, it's an, an economically sound decision for farmers to do seed production. So um, I'm going to answer this question uh, quickly so that, because I want to get to everybody's question. Um, what seed companies have been bought out by Monsanto and other um, corporate corporations, corrupt corporations? <laughs> corrupt corporations? Um, uh, so we have a seed map that's here. It's kind of outdated, but um, we have it, and it shows that like 98% or something of the seed companies in the world actually are owned by the five top chemical companies in the world. So um, I actually um, have, I won't mention where I've gotten kicked out of showing that map, but um, I didn't say it was bad or good. I just was showing the information and some people thought it was political. But, um, <laughs> so anyways, so you can look on that map because it's like endless. I would, couldn't name them all. So that's why it's good. Just like know your farmer about your local food, know your seed grower, and know maybe they're not selling directly because they don't do all the little fancy packages and everything, but know who they sell to. So support those companies. Um, so somebody had a good question. I'd like to hear from each person on the panel respond to this statement. Let your first because it'll be easy for you first. High quality seed production is essential to food sovereignty because food sovereignty because you can you can repeat the question in the statement. Uh, because you can just continue to grow your own seed. Um, the quality I find is really important. It's something I try to focus on this year. It definitely takes an extra level of attention to detail and making sure you have your isolation distances. And when you know you have the quality seed and you can save it again and again, your food sovereignty is safe. <laughs> Quick and perfect. Just go down the line. The person wants to hear from each person on the panel. Just make it a statement. Okay, so statement. I'd like to hear from each person. High quality seed production is essential for food sovereignty because um, because it's the foundation of a resilient food supply. Because it all starts with the seed. You're going to put a lot of work into that crop. And you want quality seed to begin with. Also, don't be fooled by organic. 
because it, the National Organic Policy allows um, hybrid seeds to be sold as organic. And when you pick up a catalog that's 100% organic, that's 90% hybrid, I'm pausing for emphasis. <laughs> that's not like the sacred cow there. That's selling out your food sovereignty. So don't buy seeds. If you care about your sovereignty, that have F1, filia 1, or hybrid in the name. Don't, don't, listen, maybe not go into the cytoplasmic male sterility conversation right now. <laughs> one row of males and two three and that no, the cell fusion is another one that we need to keep our eye on. It, it's a lot in organic systems, and it's something that is fundamentally, ethically, being asked right now. Is it the right thing? Uh, cell fusion technology. Oh. But, yeah, I guess we won't go down that road. That's kind of... Well, this is another big one. This is like heavy hitters today. Can you address geoengineering and its effect on the land, plants, and what to do? Is everything organic in a child of women am I in any way? That's what the question is, really. Say it again. Does you organic food, yeah, you go to all these celebrations we've had, then you go to the geoengineering table and they say aluminum's on everything from the sky. And it's what they say. And so that's why I think we have a question. <laughs> so are we really eating aluminum even though we're buying these wonderful organic products? Um, Do you want aluminum with your pesticides or without? <laughs> <laughs> what controls that is the federal NOP, the National Organic Policy. And some things they let you throw heavy metals on, for example, if you have peaches in the Rogue Valley and you get leaf curl, um, you have to go through the neem oil first and then show your tilth inspector that you tried the organic hippie systems first. And when those don't work, then you can spray copper. Wow. And no mention of equisine. Right. So it's NOP, it's a standard. And if you want to be politically active in that, support people that go to Washington to negotiate these revisions to the NOP or the National Organic Policy. That's where the arrow should hit if you want to be politically active in this area. Okay, so next question. We hear some concern that the non-GMO movement, including labeling, is hurting sales and perception of certified organic. Do you know of this, and how would you respond if true? I'd like to. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, a long time ago in a galaxy away, um, <laughs> I sold the first electronic publishing system to a small food company called General Mills. It's the first color one in the United States. That's what I did a long time ago. And they have departments with two or three times the number of people in this room um, just doing package redesign constantly. They're out there innovating marketing. They're changing their packaging and putting violators on. You know the, the new Cheerios box, okay? These companies that complain they're redesigning their packaging is slowing them up or just blowing hot air because they're constantly changing packaging to be, to be competitive and just to throw something on the back that says this says GE on it or not is like nothing to them. So don't believe that when you hear that. So the answer is no. I don't think it's a geoengineering question. Is aluminum on our food from the road? No, that's Valley? not the question. Has it been tested? Jeff is gone. Go ahead, Jeff. I mean, I think that's kind of like the same issue with the water, the DET, if you're on the soil, since they're not in our control at this point. So we're doing the best we can with what's possible, but we can't stop what you're spraying in the air. There's no way unless we're, we're, we're creating in some sort of a vacuum, you know? So yeah. it's a problem, but to say that we can do anything about it, I think it's out of our hands right now. So, are there any tests that actually say yes, it's on organic food? Well, it would be just as if it's in the soil, it's going to be just as much on organic food than non organic. So, it's, I think jokingly, I'm actually serious that you can choose to have the aluminum with or without your pesticides. 
So you can choose organic, <laughs> organically grown right. or not. Right. This is what's in the soil is in the soil, we can work with it all we can. Um, but as farmers, and that's why it's so important, you know, I mean, people thought DDT was super safe for a long time, some of them didn't, but it's, you know, it's still in our soil, so we have to deal with it. And so, you know, that's why you try to eat as healthy as you can, and you try not to get too caught up on it, because that can make you just as sick, too. Well, so. yeah. 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 So let me, yeah, go ahead. Uh, testing you really have a sense of how it's affecting your crop. I, I think we need to, I, to me, you know, as a scientist, my own scientist, right, I've had to become a scientist to like, talk about GMOs. It's like that's what this whole movement I feel is about. We become our own scientists because the, the whole institution's been bought out. So on the geoengineering thing, it's like I, I've had a number of conversations with some of folks in this room who are really passionate about this subject. And those who are leading the whole Southern Oregon movement, how many planes have they sent up to take air samples? Oh, no, that would be prohibitive. It's like, no, where there's a will, there's a way. If we could get a baseline yeah. soil test, we could look and see where the soil tests, you know, is the aluminum going? Like, who's doing that? that? That's probably a task for somebody in this room to pick up and move forward with that. Yeah. Just a minute, um, yeah. could Chris answer the last question? Because we know, some of us know a local farmer rancher who is seeing decline in the sales of organic animal feed because people are settling for non-GMO, but that contains some of your pesticides. And he's concerned it might shift into human food. You understand non-GMO might be considered sufficient. And so, Organic is declining. Yeah, uh, uh, you talk to them and. Uh, so, um, well, uh, Chris, do you have anything to say about that? I have something to say about that. Just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so our farm is certified organic, and I deal with a lot of farmers here who use organic practices and are not certified organic. And I think it all comes down to uh, we can't all be lucky enough as we are in the Rogue Valley to know who your farmer is and who your grower is and who your rancher is. But, um, I mean, I would, it's like the lesser of evils, you know, just because somebody doesn't pay for their organic certification um, doesn't mean that they're, um, they're growing less um, quality food. And so I really struggle with that certified organic side of things because I know a lot of farmers who just choose not to buy in that system. And having bought into that system, I totally understand why. Yeah. It's, it's a joke, you know? And so, um, and I don't think that the whole word organic should have been bought in the first place. So I understand people rebelling against that system. So um, at the same time, if someone cares enough to say, you know, they're buying GE free, but it's not organic, I'd rather them buy GE free, you know, than, than buy GE. So it's just, I think it's all about, you know, Supporting what's most important and finding the lesser of evils. Yeah, so Jensen yeah. might be glad that they bought non GMO instead of organic. Mm -hmm. so, but thank you. Yeah. But organic sales are continuing to grow at a healthy pace. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, to yeah. be yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know what the statistics were who went to organic ecology in Portland, but they're basically, I mean, they can't. I mean, we just cannot keep up with the demand for organic, so I don't, I don't feel like it's declining any, which is, which is great. So um, this is about for um, for seed savers themselves. What resources, what resources available for people who want to home seed to do home seed breeding and to make sure we start with the varieties that are not restricted? Jonathan. Well, I'll recommend one book uh, called uh, "Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties" by Carol Deppy and. Corvallis, Oregon here, uh, a variety that is protected, it should be on the label. In other words, if you buy a patented seed, that package should say there's a patent. If there's a PVP, it should say there's a PVP. If there is a PVP, you can still save your own seed. If it's patented and doesn't say that it's patented, and I have seen this, you're still free to use it until you get a cease and desist order. If the seller did not tell you that this was patented, then they cannot prosecute you for violating a patent that they failed to inform you about. Okay. And it also mentioned Saska as a resource, Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association. Um, what was the driving force of alfalfa farmers moving away from GE 
above it. Non, non profitable or not, not economically viable. Poor production. I know farmers that, um, you know, even here in this county who had said that they just found that conventional um, alfalfa actually gave a better yield and they were using organic practices yeah. than they did on their GE crops. And you'll hear that a lot. So um, that and also just the demand, the export market has been, you know, all the losses in the export market from the U.S. has had. Um, so that's one of the, the reasons. Yeah, I, as well, not only Montana, did I, did I talk to ranchers up there who were growing uh, GE alfalfa who stopped growing it. I talked to, uh, over, the, over the past several years, I've talked to a couple of farmers down in Siskiyou. I believe this was back in 2012, 2013, when alfalfa, right after alfalfa was deregulated, but they, uh, they said they had stopped growing it because it was just not worth the, it was not economically worth it because the herbicides that they had to put on the, the crop, um, really there was no need for that because it was not that, uh, there was not, uh, they, uh, the weeds were not an issue. The alfalfa was able to out-compete the weeds. It really just wasn't economically viable. But can I ask, so, but they still had, they had to put the herbicides on the crop? If it's GE, yes, you have to. So there's a there's a quota of a certain amount. Of yeah. they don't have a They're even moving on to gauges on their tractors so that they know how much they actually sprayed. It's written into the contract. You you don't like you, you buy the seeds. You agree to you rent the seeds. You, you do what they tell you to do. Otherwise, you end up with weed outbreaks, and they're like, oh no, we, we need you guys to do just as we say. And now they're having to come up with all these chemical cocktails to be able to kill all these monster weeds and so, but they want you to do just as they tell you. you have to. I just want to ask that question, a follow-up question to this is, um, were, were the alfalfa farmers in Montana having some of those issues about the super pests and super weeds? Nope. nope. Yeah, but they just, it was a more a moral decision that they made? It's just, it's a, a roundup, so roundup resistance is mostly happening in the soybeans and the corn throughout the United States. It's in cotton. It's not happening in, say, uh, uh, sugar beet fields that just got deregulated three years ago or in the alfalfa that just got deregulated four years ago in 2011. You know, th these, th that, but stay tuned, right? You know, these people who have been growing it five years and six years alfalfa, Roundup Ready, it's likely, yeah, to follow suit with what uh, corn and what we've seen with soybeans. So last question we have on here, we've got all of them. What would you suggest to citizens of our community to support local food sovereignty? And what are your thoughts on the concept of victory gardens? Victory gardens, that's just basically growing your own food and saving your own seed and maintaining the ability to feed yourself if uh, the grocery store goes away or you just don't want to go there. So I think everybody should grow gardens. Mm -hmm. Thank you.